Welcome back to the channel. Today we're continuing our look at The Last of Us. This is episode three. I've just come off the back of a bunch of night shifts, so <laughs> apologies if I'm not quite with it today, but I know how much you're enjoying watching the series, so I wanted to continue looking at it. As with the previous videos, this is gonna contain basically all the spoilers for the episode and also content warning, there might be some gory stuff too. So until I fall asleep, let's jump into it. We see this pretty gnarly scene of someone that's infected and trapped under the rubble. The fungus projecting out from the body like we know cordyceps does when it infects insects in real life. <sighs> the makeup here is just so well done. It's making my skin crawl. The way we see the fungal hyphae here under the skin and also growing through the right eye socket, completely eroding through the right eyeball. And under these kind of plate-like protrusions of fungus, you know, you commonly see these in the wild, don't you? We can see some green pussy discharge, probably because the fungus as it's eroded through the skin, you've lost your natural barrier of the skin, meaning you're more likely to get sort of secondary bacterial infections. We also see the sclera here of the eye, so the white part of the eye has turned yellow, indicating jaundice. Now, there are lots of causes of jaundice, but in this instance, it's likely that as the fungus has eroded through the liver, the liver's beginning to fail. In fact, if you took a blood test from this patient, you'd probably find that everything has started to fail. The heart, the lungs, liver, kidney, bone marrow. Given the fact the fungus has probably invaded into every organ of the body and also the sheer disease burden of carrying a fungus like this, compounded by the malnutrition. And therefore, this chat would be at risk from multiple medical complications, not least turning septic. So with the severity of the infection, this would trigger a huge reaction by your immune system that ends up putting you into circulatory collapse. And when thinking about it, you'd expect most of these zombies would have been killed at this point by sepsis. Cordyceps mutated. Some of it got into the food supply. Probably a basic ingredient like flour or sugar. Yeah, cool. So we kind of find out explicitly what we knew already, that the initial infection was spread from people eating contaminated flour, meaning there were multiple outbreaks all over the world and then community spread from the infected biting other people. So two different transmission methods combining to cause the rapid spread. You eat enough of it, it'll get you infected. And he's right when he says people eating enough of the contaminated grain causes a problem, we call this the infectious dose, so how much you need of a particular pathogen to cause an infection. So the more of a particular pathogen you get, the more likely your immune system might struggle with it, but it's also gonna struggle with any diseases it's not seen before, like COVID and like cordyceps that we see here. When I first saw this instant testing device, I was a little bit dismissive. I thought it's, it's very convenient to the plot that something works like this. And of course it is convenient to the plot, but I think there may actually be some realism in this. To me, it's working probably something like a blood glucose test, which okay, isn't that quick, but probably the most rapid blood test we have. And my first thought and ask any doctor, I'm sure they'd think the same thing on seeing this negative test result is, what is the sensitivity of the test, i.e. how accurate is it in picking up people that are infected? Given how catastrophic it would be if you got a false negative, you've got to hope that this test is pretty accurate. What the f Everything tastes good when you're starving. Yeah, but not like this. Everything, no doubt, does tastes good when you're starving, but not everything is good for you. I'm thinking here about refeeding syndrome, which is a life-threatening complication of eating too much too quickly after being starved. Usually we're talking not eating for over a week, so it's unlikely to happen after a couple of days, but if Frank has been eating sporadic meals for a few weeks, then it's still a possibility. Basically your cells go into overdrive, replacing the nutrients they've been without, and this causes major shifts of salt out of the blood, 
particularly magnesium, potassium, and phosphate. And this can put your heart into funny rhythms, even a cardiac arrest. So with these patients, you need to slowly introduce their diet and supplement them with electrolytes and vitamins, all while monitoring them closely. Most of what we learned about refeeding syndrome is heartbreaking as it was from the liberation of concentration camps where tragically many of the rescued prisoners would die from eating the wrong things too quickly. <laughs> oh. oh! I traded Joel and Tess one of your guns for a packet of seeds. Which gun? <laughs> I was not expecting an episode like this. It's a real change in tone from the previous two episodes, but certainly not an unwelcome one. I love the kind of joy they have <laughs> for eating strawberries for the first time in ages, and also the frustration they must have had knowing they exist, but just not being able to get the seeds for them. Also not forgetting the madness that they traded a gun <laughs> for the strawberry seeds. No, we gotta get you inside. No, Frank! Right here. Leave the gas on! Right Leave here. the gas on. Right here. The fence, the fence will kill the rest of them. Okay, yep. <laughs> I made a list. Oh man, okay. Bill here gets a gunshot wound to the abdomen. We saw this in the first episode with Joel's daughter. This is not a great injury to have when there is no healthcare system. And Frank is trying his best to do what he can in this situation. He's using a bottle of spirit, no doubt, because the alcohol content will help keep his hands clean. It's not quite enough alcohol in spirit to kill bacteria. You need at least 60% alcohol, whereas spirits tend to be around 40%, but I guess it's better than nothing. But he'd probably keep it as sterile by not faffing around with an open wound with your bare hands. You definitely shouldn't be just pouring it on the wound though. That's likely to irritate the tissue further. The only things you can do, he does do pretty well, keeping the patient immobilized. So he's on the dining room table here. I like that. And also applying pressure with clean gauze to try and stop any bleeding and encourage a clot. He's doing that too, so good job. The last thing he could potentially do is get help, but in this situation, it's kind of impossible unless one of the raiders that are currently coming in happens to be a general surgeon. Okay, there we go. Wow, okay, I did not expect Bill to still be alive. Given the bleeding we saw, and no doubt the bleeding that was going on into his abdominal cavity, and the fact Bill was beginning to lose consciousness, so my thought was he was likely going into hemorrhagic shock, so life-threatening circulatory collapse. Looking back at the wound though, in fairness, it is pretty small, although you can't see the exit wound or what damage is going on deeper, but it does look to have stopped bleeding, at least from the wound site. So perhaps this has just damaged the abdominal wall and missed the major blood vessels and organs. It's difficult to get exact stats on these things, but if you make it into hospital, the mortality of isolated gunshot wounds to the abdomen is pretty low, often around 10%, but clearly a lot of people aren't gonna make it to hospital. Death is usually in the first few hours from blood loss, and after that, a significant percentage will die a few days later from infections from bursting the bowel open. And something that I read that I didn't expect to be so high is that 25% of abdominal gunshot wounds that come into hospital can be managed non-operatively. So essentially, the bullet misses the major blood vessels and the bowels too, and so you can just monitor the patient for signs of bleeding or bowel injury with examination, vital signs, blood tests, and imaging. And if any changes, you can go to surgery and explore and repair the damage. So overall, bill survival seems pretty unlikely, but certainly not impossible. A little whitey. Yeah. Big roundy. Mm -hmm. Real mixed emotions watching these scenes. Sad because Frank clearly has some kind of chronic or even progressive disease, but equally the love that Bill is showing him by caring for him, it brings a tear to your eye, it really does. Bill here is doing a phenomenal job in a difficult situation. I mean, let alone dealing with an apocalypse, but then being the sole carer for Frank here who is his lover as well. That's a real complex dynamic. And as much as the world we're seeing in the show is pretty mad, 
This is a situation probably hits us the hardest because it feels so real. And working in the emergency department, it isn't just fast paced time critical stuff. You see so much of what people are doing in the community as carers and looking after their loved ones. And also you see when people hit a real crisis in their care, like they can't care for their loved ones anymore. And when you hear about the struggles that people have gone through before that crisis, it can be absolutely heartbreaking. I think overall Bill looks to be coping well, but we see a glimpse here of him struggling to transfer Frank to the bed. Imagine if Bill was like 10 years older and had his own health problems. I won't. You will, and then your feet get blue. Bill, I'm not fighting about it. Back in I bed. I promise you I'm going to stay up. Why? Because this is my last day. I actually thought this is where the story would be going. And respect to the show for putting in something as highly emotive as assisted suicide. So Frank is seeking Bill's help to end his life to prevent further suffering. I'm a doctor in the UK and both assisted suicide and euthanasia is illegal here. So I really don't know a lot about it, but physician assisted dying is legal in many parts of the world, each with their own regulations. And having worked in a hospice for several months as one of my first doctor jobs, I saw a few people that would have wanted to take this route to end their lives. Who's coming, Bill? The door-to-door -door -door MRI salesman? <laughs> there wasn't anything to cure this before the world fell apart. I've made up my mind. We don't find out what Frank's condition is. I assumed it was some kind of cancer, purely because this was the most common reason I saw patients like Frank in the hospice and thinking his frailty was caused by the burden of the disease. However, when they say that no cure exists, they must know what disease he has and therefore there'd be no way they could diagnose a cancer without imaging and a biopsy. Plus, if it was cancer, you'd probably expect him to look a lot thinner, so be more cachectic. And just giving it a quick Google, the writers here have said it's a neurodegenerative condition like ALS or MS, which in retrospect makes a lot of sense because there are no cures and his symptoms are primary neurological. By that, I mean associated with the nervous system. So he's requiring a wheelchair struggling to paint and struggling to use his knife and fork. Of those, I think ALS is most likely given it's more common in men and the rapid onset. But I think the writer said it wasn't a specific illness. ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is a type of motor neurone disease. As the name suggests, means the nerves to your muscles are damaged, leading to weakness and wasting of the muscles and eventually people will die from not having enough strength to breathe or from aspiration pneumonia, so where the food goes into the lungs from not being able to swallow properly. Although primarily affecting the muscles, it can also affect the brain causing dementia too. And it has an average life expectancy super short from diagnosis of just five years. So there you have it, another fantastic episode, but not at all what I was expecting. A TV show like this dealing with these really big and emotive issues like degenerative conditions, caring for people, assisted dying, and they handled it in such a brilliant way. So there are my thoughts. What did you guys think about it? As always from the previous videos, I love reading your comments, it always informs my next video. So let me know what you thought, just because it was so different and dealing with such emotive subjects. And so if you got this far, give the video a like and consider subscribing too. I hope you're all well. Thank you for watching. I'm off to get some sleep, but I'll be back soon.